So we're going to get back into Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to finish Jonah chapter 1. We looked at the first three verses last week. So we're going to be off next week, Easter. We're going to have, still have big church, but no Sunday school. And then um, the following week, Kenan's going to teach. Is that right, Kenan? You ready to go? You want to give us a preview? I'm not ready. Okay. <laughs> You're going to do Jonah 2, and then I'm back up in Jonah 3, and then I think Ford's going to do Jonah 4. Is that right? Something like that. Um, so anyway, this is, a, this is a, great, a great study in Jonah. I'm not sure what we're going to do after Jonah yet, but we'll get there. We'll figure that out. So um, if you got your Bibles turned to Jonah, I'll open up in prayer first. Uh, Father, thank you for this morning. It's exciting to be together uh, with other believers. Uh, it's more exciting even to be able to hear your word and to know that this is your word straight from your mouth uh, directly to our hearts, uh, to my heart, to everyone's heart, that you have sovereignly ordained that we listen and hear and apply these words um, to our hearts today. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, plow our hearts, soften them, uh, make them receptive uh, to what you want us to learn in our lives, and, and just mature us and give us a greater desire to come after you and to follow you and to walk with you. We, we desire that. In Jesus' name, amen. I, uh, the title of our message is, you can run, but you can't hide. And that really is the story of Jonah. I'm going to go ahead and read the entire first chapter, even though we read, uh, studied the first three, and then we will, uh, we'll cover it here in, in a few minutes. Um, starting in verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of uh, Amity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But... Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And you remember it was just the opposite way. Um, Nineveh was 500 miles northeast. Tarshish was really west, southwest, they believe, towards, uh, towards Spain, like 2,000 miles. And he goes, goes the opposite way. And it, and it says, uh, from the presence of the Lord. And you might remember we said that, that when you disobey the word of the Lord, you leave the presence of the Lord. I mean, that's just simple. That's, that's what's happening here. And so he went down to Joppa and he found a ship which was going to Tarshish and he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. There was a great storm on the sea so the ship was about to break up. And then the sailor, sailors... Uh, became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and, and lain down and fallen sound asleep. This is just amazing to me. I just can't, I can't imagine sleeping that soundly. But, but anyway, that, that's where he was. And so the captain, verse 6, approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we don't all perish. And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who has made the sea and the dry land. And then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, Now, could you, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And so they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea is becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me this storm has come upon you. Verse 13, However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even more stormier against them. 
Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So verse 15, they picked up Jonah, they threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now we're going to stop there. In the original Hebrew, the last verse, 17, really goes with the second chapter. So that's where we will pick up next week. He was privileged to have grown up in a Christian family. He came to know the Lord early in his life. He was married with children. He was a prominent businessman, successful, but he had been in spiritual decline. And really no one knew it, like so many of us. You couldn't tell because he never missed church. He never missed Sunday school. He always stood for the truth. But inwardly, he was gradually slipping with his walk with the Lord. He'd been neglecting his personal time of prayer and Bible study uh, while continuing to gratify more of his personal passions and loves of the world behind the scenes. It was around 11 p.m. one night that his wife and children were asleep. And as he was slipping and backsliding in his personal life, he decided, motivated by his passions and really to cope with his unhappiness, he decided to slip out of bed and drive himself to an adult entertainment club where no one would know have a few drinks and come back. It was there he encountered a man at the bar that provoked an argument in his attempt to get away from him. He got more intoxicated and the quarrel between he and this man elevated. It heated up. And when he decided to leave the adult entertainment club, he went out to his car and the man he was arguing with followed him to his car. It was there outside the club that it came to a head and it brought the worst out of him, causing him to draw his pistol and fire in a direction of the antagonizer, not exactly at him, but near him to scare him away. And as the gun went off, the bullet ricocheted and hit the antagonizer in the leg. The police came and suddenly my friend, a believer and privileged spiritually, running from the Lord, a regular church member with a great family and a great job, was booked for attempted murder. All because he wanted to slip out unseen and slip back in and no one would know. And he, like Jonah, became very well aware of Hebrews 10.31, which probably more aware than any of us have been, which says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we started our lesson last week. You remember Jonah had also great spiritual privilege. Uh, but when it came to choosing to obey God's Word unconditionally, and decided not to. He couldn't reason that God's Word was exactly what He should be, so he decided to follow his own desires and his own passions, and spiritually privileged Jonah ran from God's Word and God's assignment. And he learned the hard way, super hard way, and what's interesting is, I don't know if you notice this, but Jonah is written in the first person. And most people believe Jonah wrote this book. And Jonah wrote this book because he wants us to understand what his mistakes were, to evaluate it and consider it in our own lives so that we don't make the same mistakes. And I think we mentioned this last week, no matter what your spiritual privileges are, no matter how great a Christian you've been, no matter what God has done for you uh, up to this point, we still need to continue to be obedient. Sinclair Ferguson said this, I'll re-quote it, Great blessings 
Listen to this. Great blessings only bring present fruitfulness when they are met with continuing obedience. We tend to live in the past and say, look at all the things I've done. But when we slip off and we start to go the wrong way, like we see in my friend's life or in Jonah's life, these kind of things can happen. And I love what Donald Gray Barnhouse said. I'll, I'll say it again. The major lesson is, if we run from God, we pay the fare and then we never get where we're going. But if we go God's way, we always get where we're going and He pays the fare. And so Jonah's life is, is just an incredible, vivid warning on what happens if we so easily choose to drift away from the Word of God. Countless believers do it. We all do it. And the point is, is you can run from God, but you can't hide. Doesn't matter what it is. God can do whatever He wants to to get our attention. And I can promise you that my friend will tell you the same thing. Ask Jonah. Ask anybody. Ask my friend. And so let's evaluate the steps backwards. What did Jonah do to get out of God's will? And to face all these problems. Well, number one, last week we can say Jonah backed out. <laughs> he backed out, verses 1 through 3, out of God's will. It just seemed probably little to him. You know, uh, I'm a Hebrew. I love the nation of Israel. It's just not, I just don't want to see God take His grace and His mercy and save these pagans. This does not add up to me. I want what I want. I want what I believe is right. I want to satisfy what I want to do. So Jonah backs out. And anytime we use the word out with God's will, we're in trouble. And so John, Jonah backs out. Then this, this week, number, number one, verses four through six, Jonah sacks out. Then verses seven through 11, Jonah chickens out. And lastly, verses 12 through 16, Jonah bails out. So he backs out, he chickens out, and he bails out. Now that's cute, but it's real. It's real. And it should resonate with us that even when it starts in your mind, little things that start in our mind that think these thoughts are okay, this is all right, nobody will ever know. Anytime we are going out of God's will, the alarms need to go off. And so let's just look and see here. Number one, Jonah sacks out. Now notice verse 4. He believes he can run out of God's will. He believes that if I just slip out for a minute, nobody will notice. And I'll slip back in when it's right. And we want to run sometimes. And we want to do this, but God's not going to let us. And look what, look what God does. It says, the Lord hurled... It's unbelievable. It's, it's a vision that God's sitting in heaven and He sees everything that's going on in your life and my life. He knows every single thing. He hurls a great wind on the sea and it says there's a great storm on the sea that the ship's about to break up. Now this word hurl in the original Hebrew means He throws a spear. I mean, He doesn't miss. It's a strike right down the middle. Since Jonah should be in Nineveh, God throws a storm, throws him in a storm on the sea. He orchestrates it perfectly. He, he sovereignly directs this storm exactly when and where he wants it. Now that's sobering, isn't it? He can do that anytime he wants to in my life and your life. He certainly did in my friend's life. And I think we can never forget that when we disobey, God will attach a storm to it. You're not going to find peace. You're not going to find peace. I'm not going to find peace if I want to follow my own way because God's going to attach some sort of storm that's going to make us uncomfortable in our lives. And it's usually proportionate to our disobedience, isn't it? If I lose my temper with Amy, it results in a mini storm. <laughs> Depends on how big my temper was or how bad it was. If I get prideful in a relationship, there's usually a storm 
that's attached to it. Um, it may come immediately. It may be delayed. But the point is there's always consequences to going out of God's will. And the word storm indicates, it's interesting, in the Hebrew, torrential downpours. It's, it's a hurricane type storm. I mean, it is big. And, and look, it says, and notice it was a, the word great storm, a great wind and a great storm. It was so big, we can assume that these sailors on the ship had never experienced anything like this before. Um, and and it, was, it was terrifying because, because they could sense this little wooden ship's going to break apart. I mean, it's at the edge of, of just blowing up. Gale force winds. No hope. God had designed, again, the clouds and the wind and the rain, not to kill everybody immediately, but to bring it just to the point, just to the edge, just to the tipping point that it was going to break apart totally, to destroy everything. Obviously big enough to get your undivided attention. Nothing else to focus on but to save my life. Verse 5, Then the sailors become afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. I mean, I mean, that's what happens, isn't it? When in life, when, when things get bad, when it really wakes you up is when death is on your doorstep. I mean, if you want to get someone's attention, just say, hey, you got 30 days to live, 60 days to live. Or you go to a funeral and you see someone's died suddenly. That's what gets people's attention is that life is not forever. We tend to think in our own personal lives that it just is going to be tomorrow and next week and next month and on and on and on. But reality is life is short. And so when God wants to get our attention, no doubt He'll bring us to the edge of, of our life. And so this is what's happened. And so in God's providence, He's working in mysterious ways, isn't He? Beyond really what we can think or imagine, and I love this point too, it's beyond us. God's bringing discipline on Jonah, obviously. But he's also drawing divine attention to these sailors that we don't even know who they are. These sailors that find Jonah on the ship with them. They, they become afraid, and look, they're crying to their God, small g. And look what God's doing. He is using the sinfulness of Jonah to bring these pagan sailors to salvation. Isn't that amazing? He brings them to the end of their lives, and it says it's causing so much fear, it drives them to consider what's going on. And then it says, But Jonah had gone below in the bottom of the ship. He lay down and fall, falls asleep. Yeah, that's still amazing, isn't it? I don't know if any of you can sleep that well. But Jonah could, and I read, I actually looked this up, excessive sleeping is common symptom with major depression. Sometimes people sleep more than usual to help manage emotional pain and depression. Uh, it, it's been said that sleeping too much is a psychological effect of the reduction of neurotransmitters common among depressed people. We have to assume he wasn't comfortable. Uh, we're never comfortable when we run from God, when we disobey Him. Matter of fact, I think some of the most miserable people in the world are when we're disobeying God. Uh, we can mask it. But the reality is we're not at peace and we're, we're super upset. And so many times we sleep when we're in disobedience to escape reality. Disobedience is draining, isn't it? Think about that. Why? Because most of the time when we're disobedient, we don't want to think about God. We don't want to think about the consequences. We don't want to think about being disobedient. We don't want to think about the results. So we just sleep. We just kind of sleep it off. We try to get away from it. Not only that, it's a great illustration spiritually, isn't it? Because when we're out of His Word, we're asleep to His will. We don't want to do what His will says. And I think... It's a great 
time to stop and ask ourselves, are we, are we maybe asleep to God's will this morning? Is there something in our lives that maybe we're chasing or thinking about or, or we're more focused on than God's will? It's so easy to do. Are we dozing off spiritually? Are there spiritual responsibilities with the Lord that we need to be taking care of in our lives? That we're just kicking the ball down the road and we're saying it doesn't matter. But it does matter. And so verse 6, the captain approached Jonah, and you can imagine, here this ship is about to, it's not like a major huge ship, probably the size of these two rooms. And you got one passenger. Everybody else is out bailing water, doing everything they can to keep the ship afloat. You got this one guy, nobody knows, asleep in the bottom of the ship. What's he doing? What in the world is he doing? And, and it's, he goes, how are you sleeping? Get up and be a part of this to save us. Call on your God. Perhaps your God's going to be concerned about us and we're not going to die and perish. And the pagan, God, uh, pagan um, captain, the unbeliever, <laughs> he, he's shocked to see Jonah's indifference. And God's sovereignly using this unbelieving captain to wake up Jonah, to shock Jonah back into his relationship with the Lord. He says, get up. Notice that. Get up. Stop backing out. Stop sacking out. Get up. Repent. Get up and call on your God. Notice that word, get up and call. You know what's interesting? It's the exact same two words used in verse 2 when God said, arise and cry against Nineveh. Those two words that Jonah was asked to do by God are the same two words that the captain asked Jonah to do when he's sleeping. And you've got to think that all of a sudden the light bulbs are turning on in Jonah's life. That God is using this, this unbelieving captain to wake Jonah up. I think it's at this point that Jonah starts to have a wave of guilt come over him. To think, man, I'm in serious trouble. And, and I remember, you remember, I was just thinking about this in, in Genesis 42 and the famine had happened and Joseph's brothers were sent to Egypt and they end up meeting Joseph. He accuses them of being spies. He speaks harshly to them. Do you remember that? They're like, what's going on? Leave Simeon with us and go bring your younger brother, and yet, you remember the next verse, it just pops up. It just pops up. And in verse 21, it says, the brothers had this wave of guilt come over. We're guilty. This is happening to us because of what we did for our, to our brother 20 years ago. And so I think Jonah's having this same feeling. He's having this just wave of guilt that hits him, that all these problems that I'm facing right now that are insurmountable, that are beyond me, it's because of my disobedience to God and my guilt. And so God is working in the lives of these pagan sailors. He's working in the heart of His servant Jonah to bring him back. And so Jonah's backed out, he's sack, sacked out, and he's, <laughs> he's still out. He chickens out. Look at verse 7. So each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we can learn on whose account this calamity has struck. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now you say, what is a lot? What is, what is this? Well, in ancient times, casting lots was a way to determine divine answers, well, what, what God wanted them to do. It was, like, it was like rolling dice, something like dice. It, they could have been made of stone or wood or even bones. And, and God did... Um, use that sometimes to determine His will, for people to determine His will in that day. After all, we didn't have the Word of God. We don't use that now. We have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to speak directly to us. But God did use that in Proverbs 16, speaks about it. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So God, God used the lots and He sovereignly work through it. Barnhouse said, men would roll the dice, but God 
is the one who makes the spots turn up. And so all of a sudden they somehow cast the lots and points directly to Jonah, sovereignly. He was the one causing the trouble. He was the one that had brought all the trouble on him. It was him. It was him. And naturally the sailors go, what in the world are you doing? Like, I mean, we're about to die. You've been asleep. We cast the lots. No doubt you're the problem. And then they just start peppering questions. What in the world? Who are you? And they ask him five questions. I want you to notice this. Five questions. They ask him first, tell us now on, on whose account has this calamity struck us? In other words, who's responsible for the storm? Next, what's your occupation? What's your job? What are you doing? And where do you come from? And where's your country? Number four. And finally, from what people are you? What, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord God. Listen. Listen my God, of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And so he, he answers four out of the five questions with this answer. Notice who's responsible for the storm, the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Wait, your God made the sea? Your God made the heavens and the land? And that means your God is the one responsible. Wow, we need to hear more. And you can imagine they get more panicked. And where do you come from? What's your country? Who are your people? And Jonah an answers it by saying, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew. I'm, I'm from the people of Israel. But notice he doesn't answer one question. You see what question he doesn't answer? What is your occupation? What's your job? What do you do? Why do you think he answered it? Well, he was a prophet. Not anymore. Now, how many prophets were there running around? There weren't thousands of prophets. As a matter of fact, if you look in the Bible, there weren't more than 50 prophets mentioned. He had been divinely chosen to be a prophet of God, to speak God's words directly, and yet he was running from that. He had all of that privilege, but not anymore. He's running from God, and so he can't say, Hey, I'm God's prophet. So he doesn't say anything. He doesn't state his occupation because he chose to leave it. He chose to walk away from the privilege. I'm running from it. So he chickens out, and his rebellion against God's Word prevents him again from witnessing for God. It always does. I thought about this and I, I wonder, you know, I can't help but think that maybe he did say and mumble under his breath, I used to be a prophet. <laughs> I used to speak for God, but not anymore. We're at odds. I, I don't agree with him. I'm running from him. Now, can you imagine what those words meant to the sailors when they heard that? They heard that he worships the God who made the sea and the land, and now they're, he's telling them, I, I spoke directly. I got word directly from God, and I was one of the very rare few that spoke divine words to the people to tell them what God was going to do. And they hear that, and look, verse 10, they become extremely frightened. They're getting it. The Hebrew says they became fearful with great fear. It means their fear is intensifying. They were already fearful. They were already scared because of the storm. Now they understand Jonah's running from God, and that added even more fear because he was the majestic, awesome, all-knowing, one true God. And that fear drove them even to be more terrified. So they got the fear of God in front of them, and they got the fear of the storm in front of them. And then they say, how could you do this? Ha! For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. And so they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea is going to become calm again for us 
because it's getting worse. <laughs> it's gathering momentum, increasingly stormy. You know what's interesting? These, these non-believers are dumbfounded with Jonah's rebellion and disobedience. They seem to grasp his sinfulness and his rebellion more than he does. And you think, how, how can that happen? Well, we know. Sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you think you can slip out of your house at 11 o'clock at night, run down to the adult entertainment club, have a few drinks, satisfy yourself, slip back in a couple hours, and nobody will know. That's what it does. Sin makes us think we can get away with things. You know that. And sometimes the non-believers have more sense than the believers, and this is what's happening. Why in the world didn't Jonah hit his knees and repent right now? I mean, that's the question. I mean, Jonah just laid all the cards on the table, and, and Jonah could have just said, it's my fault i got to repent right now. And if I repent and hit my knees and turn back to the Lord, the storm will stop. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He's backed out, sacked out, chickened out. And now he bails out. It's the picture of the sinfulness of our hearts. Yeah, that, that's what this is. And, and you might shake your head and wonder, but don't shake your head and wonder because my heart and your heart's made out of the same kind of stuff. You see, that's what sinfulness of sin does for me and for you. And that is the danger. That's one of the pictures. That's what God's trying to teach us this morning is that just a little bit of this and a little bit of that of disobedience continues to snowball and we back out of God's will and we run from God's will and it's out, 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 down, down, down. It's a warning for all of us. And so lastly, Jonah bells out. Look, verse 12, he said to them, pick up me up and throw me into the sea and the sea will become calm for you for I know that on the account of me here he is the storms come upon me ha! Jonah's hit rock bottom but he still can't connect the dots he still can't connect the dots to repent and turn because he won't give up his own personal desire what he wants to do he preferred death over repenting he'd rather drown to death than be obedient I mean that's the wicked heart isn't it God made it crystal clear why all this was happening because Jonah acknowledges it straight up. While the storm is on the ship, it's because of me. But he wouldn't submit. He wouldn't submit to the living God. It's on my account. Listen, we're no match for God. God sees everything in our lives. He knows everything. We can't bypass. We can't do end runs around the Word of God. We can never win against God. Ever. You see, there's never, ever a path. Why can't we get this? There's never, ever a path of disobedience that will lead to peace. It's just the opposite. And so verse 13, the men rode desperately to return to land. Um... But they couldn't. They knew that to throw Jonah overboard would be murder. I, I mean, they're like, you put us in a tough situation to just execute you now, and we're up for murder? I mean, we got to row to land. We got to do something else. But again, they can't fight it either, and they can't get it back. And so they pick him up and throw him in the sea. Uh, Jonah's a weenie. He doesn't throw himself in, does he? Just have these men pick him up and throw him in. They, they have to execute. And just like Jonah said, the sea became instantly calm. Instantly. Now, if you've ever been around the ocean, there's been a big storm. The waves continue for a long time. Not here. The Bible says in some translations that the water's went still, the waves stood still immediately. And so exactly like Jonah said, what happened, happened. And the sailors had a personal encounter with the living God. And not only did they pray earnestly, look, 
pray to the Lord in verse 14. Notice this. Then they called on the Lord and said, but they acknowledged His sovereign ability to do as He pleases. Do you see what they're saying? They're praying to the Lord, not to their God, little God with a G, and they're acknowledging that He's sovereign and He can do whatever He wants to. And then they say, the Lord has done as He's pleased. There's been a change in their minds of who God is. And then in verse 16, look what it says. The men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifice. Now, it's interesting. The sailors had mentioned fear three times. In verse 5, they were fearful of the storm. In verse 10, they were fearful of Jonah. But now, the sailors are fearful and in awe and reverence of the Lord God Jehovah Himself. And so they come to saving faith. They come to saving faith. And notice it wasn't a foxhole conversion. It wasn't like, okay, we're going we're to make a deal with the Lord when we're in the middle, like so many people do, middle of these problems, and then afterwards they leave. No, they made a deal with the Lord after everything calmed down. They came to know Him. Everything was settled. Everything was good. And that's when they did business with the Lord. That makes us think it was a genuine conversion for the sailors. And Jonah did all he could to not be a part of saving these Gentile Ninevites. And now, <laughs> interestingly enough, in his rebellion, God saves the Gentile sailors. Now, what does that tell you? Think about it. Sinful Jonah, he backs out, he sacks out, he chickens out, he bells out. God is sovereign over all of it. God is still reigning and ruling and accomplishing all of His purposes. That's really the greatest lesson in the book, isn't it? We can't run from God. We can't hide from God. If God sovereignly saved you and He sovereignly saved me, then He's going to accomplish all His purposes, no matter what we do. If we run from Him, it's just going to be harder. Someone put it this way, what God is going to do, He will do. I love that. What God is going to do, He will do. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? What a great story. Let me close with this. Three things I want to, I want to close with. Number one, notice, as I said, we can't run from God and expect to hide. If we run from God, it is very, 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 extremely painful if we try. Very well could be that someone's here this morning, like Jonah. You're going through the motions outwardly as a believer. You're a Christian. You love the Lord. You truly do. But inwardly, inwardly you're unplugged, like my friend. You're unplugged from the Lord. You're, you're somewhere in some amount of sin, just some private disobedience. If so, then the message to you and to me this morning is we got to repent and turn. We got, we got to get out of it. We got to get out of it. See, see, we can be outwardly conforming, but inwardly rebelling, and no path of disobedience is ever blessed. See, God's going to always intervene, He'll always intervene to bring us back. And my friend had a huge wake-up call as God got his attention. He had to resign from his business. He had to endure the embarrassment of being in the newspaper. He had to struggle with financial loss because of the cost of attorneys and the loss of his business. He had to deal with public and private humility of sin. He faced the stress of going to prison for perhaps 20 years. And just like Jonah, who faced loss, he faced the humiliation of his honored prophetic status, the loss of his spiritual influence, and the loss of life. That's number one. Number two, our sinfulness never operates in a vacuum. It always affects others. There'll eventually be ripple effects publicly from private sin, and, and it will hurt others, not just ourselves. 
Because a true believer who continues in disobedience will eventually cause, listen, a spiritual avalanche of chaos and despair in other people's lives. It just always happens that way. Imagine the shock these sailors had on the ship and what they felt and the fear that they had. And it was all directed towards because of Jonah's sin. <laughs> Our sin always affects others. My friend, his wife and his children and extended family faced the public shame of his sin. He had to deal with his friends at church and work and the regret and ridicule of talking about him and what he'd done. He'd lost respect and admiration of being a leader, a wife with his family and in the Christian circles. Thirdly, lastly, the Lord will never let His children, if you know Him, drift too far away. He's not going to do it. He's not going to let us drift too far away from disobedience. And the author of Hebrews says this in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let me read it for you. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention. We've got to be focused on what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every violation and act of disobedience received a just punishment, listen, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You won't escape. You won't. You see, a lifestyle of secret disobedience and backsliding will find us out. Is there part of Jonah in our lives today that we need to deal with? We need to deal with it swiftly. We're all sinners. We all deal with sin. This is a story. It's real. It happened to real people and real believers. And it's God's real word to me and to you. Perhaps it's something that you've stopped prioritizing in your life, God's word, and, and maybe you've quit praying You've slipped away from your Bible study. Uh, maybe you're allowing a small sin to take root and need to weed it out. Or you could have isolated yourself from people in the church. You're neglecting fellowship. You're neglecting discipleship. You're just not involved like you should be. Uh, you need to start participating. The Lord's word for us is to get in the game. Get involved. Whatever it is, the lesson for all of us is to turn from our backsliding before God makes us pay a price that we don't want to pay. We don't have to. You see, Jonah is going to make it back. He's going to make it back as an obedient servant, but it almost nearly killed him. And my friend, he made it back. Almost two years of legal battles and costs and financial ruin. But the charges got dropped and he made it back. And no matter how far you've backed out from God's will, listen to this. This is the best part. Regardless of how much you've sacked out, chickened out, or bailed out, God has far more mercy and grace than sin. He's always willing to accept us back wherever we are. He's always willing to give you more power to turn from sin, to walk with Him in obedience, to repurpose you, to reuse you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. That's the great news of the gospel, isn't it? The love and grace and mercy that's far more than every sin, any sin you could ever commit because God never gives up on us and He never loses us and He never leaves us then that's the great comfort of being a believer. Let's close. Father, thank You for this Word. Um, as I think of it, I think of it, how it applies to my own life. I need to continue to scrub my heart, to battle my thoughts, to battle my desires, and to say, Lord, I'm all in for You. 110% of me, I want to be for you. And so, Father, show me where there's areas in my life 
show all of us areas of our life that we have been maybe in disobedience uh, in, in just little ways. And Father, help us to shore that up with you, to keep short accounts, to learn from Jonah and to learn from your truth of what it means to walk with you, love you, um, be at peace with you as we're obedient in our lives. Help us to encourage each other and love each other. And, and finally, Father, um, we thank you for the immeasurable amount of grace and mercy that you've poured in our life, that no matter how bad we've been, no matter how bad we've fallen, that your blood has forgiven that and will forget that because of what your Son has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.